I think Ivy Studios has done with Brink something that a lot of publishers struggle to do, which is to take the essence of what your fans love about a game and translate it into a new game that's actually a completely unique experience while still maintaining that thing that your fans loved so much in taking the essence of Moonrakers and taking what honestly is one of my favorite parts about it, which is that intense player interaction, that necessity to interact, to negotiate, and to play the game along with the other players and bring them into your strategy. And they've done that with Brink while creating a completely new experience, which is something, again, that a lot of publishers fail to do. Um, I think we saw that with games like Farshore, where it's a new experience in the Everdell world, but it's actually just Everdell with a lot of the expansions compressed into a single game. Nothing wrong with that. It's a great game. It was my first experience in the Everdell universe, but as you back out of that and you look at Everdell versus versus Farshore, it really necessitates a question of, do I need to own both? And that question is not anywhere on the radar between Brink and Moonrakers because they are two completely different games, but they capture a feeling that if you like Moonrakers, you are probably going to enjoy that same interactive feel of Brink. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about Brink and let's talk about how this game actually plays and how it differs from Moonrakers. So I'm so glad you're here watching this. I'm Daniel, you're watching Play the Game HQ. And in front of me, I have Brink. This is from IB Studios and it is coming to Kickstarter soon. And it is a standalone game in the Moonrakers universe, but it is very different from Moonrakers. Now, I did say in that intro that it does capture a lot of the essence of Moonrakers. When I say that, I mean it captures that player interaction. Moonrakers is a game where you have to negotiate, you have to interact. There's a lot of give and take, but you cannot effectively play that game and expect to win or do well if you're not willing to negotiate with other players and at times double cross other players. And all of that is brought into Brink in a game with a completely different set of mechanics. Now the artwork is very similar. It is very obviously by looking at it, if you have played Moonrakers, a game in the Moonrakers world but it is area exploration instead of negotiating contracts. And that's something that I could see. They could have done that in, in talking about those games where you just reskin something and make it a little bit different. They could have taken this and made it ships on a map where you are exploring and going to other planets and negotiating on contracts. And they didn't do that at all. There's no contract negotiation. You are not trying to complete contracts. You're not trying to do functionally any of the things that you're doing in Moonrakers. What you're doing is exploring this map, revealing new tiles. Uh, you can kind of see it. This is how it starts out is with these five hexes right here. I'm gonna lift that up a little so you can see on that camera. And then as you play the game, you're gonna explore new tiles. You're gonna reveal new tiles and those are gonna help you earn resources and energy, but also maximizing your turn. It is also something they did with this that, that Ivy Studios tends to do pretty well is make games that feel daunting at first, that feel really big and really complex when you're reading through the rules, especially if you are just reading the rule book and learning it that way. It feels like there's a lot of moving parts, but once you actually get in and start playing it, it makes complete sense. It flows really smoothly and it is a, a relatively easy game to play. The complexity is not in the mechanics and in the rules of the game. The complexity of this game is in the choices that you're going to make and how you're going to choose to strategically move through the game. Uh, but once you get playing, everything falls into place. Everything makes sense. So again, the game is going to start out with those five tiles available. And as you play, you're going to play over three rounds and you're going to be placing three ships. Everyone has three ships, a small ship, a medium ship and a large ship. And you're going to place those ships on the tiles that are on the board. Uh, your small ship, you can place onto an existing tile or next to an existing tile. The medium ship can be placed on the border between two tiles or on the border between an explored tile and an unexplored tile. And the large ship goes on the intersection of three tiles. And again, as long as it's touching one existing tile, it can be overlapping onto unexplored tiles. And when you're on any unexplored space, you're going to explore that space. So I have one ship left. Let's say that I go right there. I would draw two tiles and I would choose where to place them again, because this ship explores three spaces or visits three spaces at a time. Once you place those tiles, you're gonna collect the resources that are on the tiles at the top in cubes, and then you're gonna do the actions that are at the bottom of those tiles. And you get to do all of the actions for the tiles that you're on. 
Now there is a huge, massively important distinction in the types of resources that you're gonna get. Because yes, they are all colored cubes, uh, but you'll notice that, and there's five different colors. Purple is wild. Throughout the game, the purple cubes are wild. There are four factions, and then there's the purple cubes, which are, are the Cerulean cubes, and those are wild. They can act as any other color of cube. But you'll notice that these cubes have no border, and these cubes have a white border. When you gain resources, they're going to act as either favor or influence. If it has a white border, it's favor, and that goes in the front of your uh, in the front of your player tray there, where everyone can see what you have. If you uh, if it doesn't have a white border, it's influence, and it goes behind your player screen. And I'm going to go ahead and take this off so you can kind of see what's going on in here. But throughout the game, you would have that up because shielding not only what you have, but later in the game how you're voting is really important as you interact with other players and negotiate with other players. So you have favor and you have influence. Favor can only be traded with other players. I only have access to those in order to trade with other players. Uh, now, if other players have favor uh, tokens in their little favor area, we can trade. And when that gets traded, it becomes influence. So if I, and I played real nice with Allison during the game a few times and said, hey, I have two purple favor. You have two purple favor. You want to trade favor for favor so that we can get this into our influence and make it usable for us. That was really nice and not playing cutthroat at all, but it worked. And as we were learning the game, it was it was a good way to just kind of feel out and get access to resources. Fix that right there, because that's annoying me and I'm sure it's annoying you. Uh, but there's also, it's open negotiation. So I could say, hey, I have these two purples. These are wild. I need blues. I'll trade two purples for four blues. It's fully open negotiation. And that is where the interaction comes in. Because as you draw, you'll notice there's equal, if not more, favor resources on the board than there are influence resources. Meaning as you get resources, there's a good chance that depending on where you go throughout the game, you are going to have more resources that you don't have access to without trading than resources that go directly into your influence tray that you can just use to buy cards and things like that. Uh, so interacting with and negotiating and trading with other players is critical to actually playing the game well. And you can make future negotiations that's fully open to whatever you wanna do. And you can make non-binding negotiations where you say, hey, I'm planning on going over here. I'm gonna get those two purple cubes. Why don't you go ahead and trade those with me? And then I'll just give you the ones that I get once I get those. And then you have the option to either honor that or double cross the players again, which is a huge part of Moonrakers is making deals that you go back on. It's, again, it's, it's space warfare. It is space negotiation. Sometimes you have to break a few eggs to make an omelet, and sometimes you have to go back on your promises in order to win the game. But that's all part of the game, and it's built into it. And it was a, um, it was just, it, it really captured that essence again in a completely different experience. It captured that interaction that I really loved about Moonrakers. So let's get back to how the game actually plays. On your turn, you're going to place a ship and you're going to take the resources from any hexagons that that ship is touching. You're also going to take the actions on any hexagons that that ship is touching. And there's four different actions you can take. You have the recruit an ambassador action that lets you recruit an ambassador from the market up here. Anytime an ambassador is recruited, it's immediately replaced. You have the upgrade action that's going to let you upgrade your ships. You can see upgraded ships here and here and here. And you're going to be working your way up a track, upgrading and adding adding one of two upgrades to potentially each of your ships to allow you to gain more power or to take more resources. You can draw two action cards. When you draw two action cards, you're going to keep one and discard one. And then you can draw one rider card and play one rider card. The rider cards directly impact the voting at the end of each round. And those are cleared out at the end of each round. And you start the game with one rider card. So when you draw a rider, you're going to have two to choose from when you place those in the rider section. Uh, so going through a little more in detail about the different actions, the ambassadors are going to cost a mixture of cubes and uh, power. Power is just each hexagon that you're on gives you one power in that faction color, unless it has this inner border, in which case it gives you two. So blue currently has three power for orange and two power for yellow. When you want to buy an ambassador or hire an ambassador, recruit an ambassador, I guess you're not buying them, you're recruiting them, you can pay any mixture of power and resource cubes. So for blue, if blue wanted to hire Dr. Umbridge, they have three power, so they would just need to come up with two orange cubes in order to buy Dr. Umbridge. 
And the ambassadors just give you, some of them give you um, abilities throughout the game. Some of them have directly to do with scoring, but they all just have a host of different abilities that are gonna impact the game. So for this purple one here, once per turn, one purple resource can be spent to take an upgrade action. It's gonna give you an extra action to upgrade your ship. And this one, after taking the action card action, take two yellow, or yeah, that's yellow, take two yellow resources from the supply. And this is a prototype, I need to say that. This is some things are going to change. The main thing that is gonna visually change is right now yellow and orange are really close together, especially on the resources. They've already addressed that. They're going to make those colors more different. There's a few things like clarity, things like that, that I know are gonna change. But if you're looking at this and saying, man, those are really close together. Yes, they are. And the publisher is aware of that and they're they are addressing that and fixing that already, um, even before the Kickstarter launches. It's just not in the prototypes that are out right now. So this ambassador gives me the ability to take two extra resources anytime I take the action card action. Those kind of things are gonna impact the actions that you take and where you go on the map. Because again, gaining resources is really important for recruiting more ambassadors or for the um, for the faction objectives. And these are purchased similar to ambassadors with a mixture of cubes and power. And those are gonna give you pretty significant advantages. There's only one faction objective in each faction once this is taken. If I decide to construct the shield lattice, this goes in my play area and no one else can do that. And the, the faction objectives just give you, again, they give you bonuses. For the shield lattice, I can immediately place the shield lattice that's this green guy right here. And then once per round, I can flip this card to move the shield lattice. And the shield lattice gives one extra power to its sector when scoring. So if this is here, then this is now worth three power instead of two power during the scoring part of the phase, not for purchasing things. And each of those different faction objectives is going to give you a different bonus. So that's the ambassador action and then also how you would purchase these. And you can purchase these anytime you have the ability to do it on your turn. The ambassador ability is a triggered ability, so you can only do that once. You can hire, you can recruit one ambassador per turn unless you have something that lets you take a different ability or you are touching two hexagons with the ambassador ability. The ship upgrade ability is gonna allow you to add upgrades to your ship. You're gonna work your way up this track. You're gonna take, you're gonna pay the resources required to move up the track, which is just shown in each of the different spaces. And each ship can be upgraded once and you upgrade in the order from your level one, level two and level three ship. And you have two options for upgrading. You can do a cargo upgrade that just doubles the resources that you take, or you can do a minigun upgrade that allows you to double the power in any of the ships that you're in. So if I was able to upgrade this all the way uh, and upgrade this ship with the minigun, then I would be getting two from this and two from this instead of one from this and one from this, which is really significant if say blue had the minigun upgrade, instead of getting three and two, they would be getting six and four power from this position right here. So that's the ship upgrade action. In addition to actually getting those bonuses, you also, if you get to the top of the ship upgrade track, you get 15 points immediately, which is a huge advantage. That's a massive, 15 points in this game is massive. It's not insurmountable, but it is a huge advantage. That's gonna give you a big buffer if you're the only person that's able to get those 15 points. Again, not insurmountable, but it is gonna give you a pretty big buffer. And then the rider card, if you take the rider card action, which is right here, then you're gonna draw one rider card. You always have one in your hand or you at least start with one. You may trade it for a resource at some point, uh, but it, you typically have a rider card in your hand. You're gonna draw another one and you're gonna play it into the rider section. And these all have to do with manipulating and impacting the vote at the end of each round. So that's the round structure. Everyone's gonna take turns placing their ships. Once everyone has placed all three of their ships and done all of the associated actions, then it goes to that boat that we keep talking about. When you vote, everyone is gonna have their shield, they're gonna be hidden behind their shield, and they're gonna secretly vote for which faction they want to win the round. Uh, and let's say I need a few more resources to do this, but right now I'm, I've am i got some, I'm pretty good with orange and blue and green, I have a few different spaces. So let's say I wanted to vote for green. Again, this would not be coming out of this supply, this would be coming out of my personal supply. And again, only out of influence, not out of favor. So I'm gonna vote three for green and two for blue, and then everyone's gonna reveal their votes. And you can vote as many cubes to as many factions as you want, but everyone's gonna reveal their vote. So you're gonna tally up the total of the votes, 
and get and then go through any writers or any ambassadors that are going to manipulate the votes. So this says um, if blue is in first place, it's going to get minus one prestige while scoring. And when you play a writer, you you choose what cube goes on there. It's a way for you to um, give favor to the factions that you are going to be voting for or to hopefully knock down the factions you're not going to be voting for. But once all of the vote manipulation is taken into play and, and accounted for, you have your final votes. Two factions are going to win first and second place. And those factions are going to go into this space right here. So let's say just for kicks that green and blue got first and second place through the voting in this, through all of the players voting. When you vote, you're going to take this number right here. This is your multiplier, and you're going to multiply that times your power for that faction. So green is four, blue is three. So I currently have one, two power in green. That's going to give me a total of eight points. And for blue, I only have one power in blue. So that's going to give me three points. Everyone's going to score that. And then you're going to pull all of your ships back to your board. You're going to reset for the round. All the riders go away and you're gonna play the next round of the game until you do your third vote, at which point you're gonna score the game. When you score, you're gonna score for sets of ambassadors. If you have, the, the ambassadors are all color coded, and if, and if you have a full set of four different colored ambassadors, you're gonna score 18 points, a set of three is worth 10, a set of two is worth five, and a single lone ambassador is worth two, and you can have multiple sets. It's just however many different sets you can make to create the most valuable combination. Uh, you are also at the end of the game based on how this voting played out. Any faction that reached this area twice, everyone is gonna score one prestige for the, the cubes of that color that they have in their supply. Uh, so blue would score, everyone would score one prestige for each blue cube they have. And then for green, they scored three times in the top. So those cubes are gonna score two. And then over here, anyone who has a, um, a faction objective card in their supply, or anyone who collected a faction objective card is gonna score one point for each token of that faction that they have or for each resource of that faction that they have at the end of the game. And whoever has the most points at the end of the game is gonna win. And that is a good, I think a good overview of Brink. Again, it takes a lot of that player interaction that I really loved in Moonrakers and wraps it up in a completely unique experience. I really enjoy that. It's not gonna be an experience that everyone likes. If you don't like player interaction, if you're more of a Euro game, kind of just do what you want to do, maximize your moves, but not have to really deal with what other people are doing unless they're just in a space you need to go. This may not be a game for you. It really does, to play efficiently, you have to interact with other players. There is a, an edge case scenario, I think, where you could just go and just play with the, the influence that you get and really strategically go to uh, to places that only give you influence and play that way. But a lot of times you're going to run into having favor that you need to trade. And there are going to be times when you're going to need to take advantage of other players. Maybe you know that they really need something because they've been trying to make a trade for a while and you have that. So you make a trade that lets them get what they need, but also works really well in your favor. One thing it doesn't have that Moonrakers had was a direct... Um, a direct benefit from double crossing other players. There were a few cards in Moonrakers. There were a few of those small, the objective cards that scored you points that encouraged you really, in order to score those cards, you had to double cross somebody. You had to, I think one of them was to lose on a contract that you were part of. Uh, that for the most part requires you to double cross the people. You need to commit to a contract and then not pull your weight and allow the contract to fail. This doesn't have that direct um, encouragement to double cross other people, but it is completely legal to double cross other people. So there are gonna be times when you feel taken advantage of, when maybe the trading doesn't go your way, or you feel like someone knows what you need and is taking advantage of that situation. For people that don't like that negotiation, that trading, that interaction, it may not be a game for you, but if you liked the way that Moonrakers felt, I really genuinely think this is gonna be a good fit for your collection. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The production value is great. It is everything we expect from an Ivy Studios game. If you have any questions about this game, be sure to leave a comment below. I'll get to those as quick as I can. And if I don't know the answer, I'll pass it along to Ivy Studios and get you an answer. This is coming to Kickstarter soon, so we'll leave a link below to where you can find that. But for now, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.